take some time off. Um, so I, I'm guessing, well, I know some of you have not been to Edmonton before. So I thought I would point out there's the North Saskatchewan. So it's uh, very pretty. And it run, North Saskatchewan runs through town. And on the North Saskatchewan is, oops, focus, focus, there we go, uh, is what was called the Edmonton Riverboat, is now the Edmonton Queen. It's been sailing since 1995. And I've heard it's kind of a cool place to go out and have like have drinks on the river. Um, and that's actually walking distance from my house, but I've never been. In part because one time, at least one time, the winds were bad and it had to get towed back to the, the docks. So it actually took people like, I think it was like 1230. So just past midnight before they actually got off the boat. So I actually haven't ever been on it, but I've heard it's very nice. And it seems like it'd be a fun thing to do, especially after COVID. So when you get to town and are looking for something fun to do, I can highly recommend checking out the North Saskatchewan River. Okay, so let me try to share my screen now. Okay, so welcome back to week two of our class. I'm glad you all are here. This week, we're gonna be delving a little more into human and AI interaction. So I asked you to read a couple of conference papers today that we'll be talking about. And then on Thursday, we're going to have a brief discussion about ethics and how those how ethics interact with human subject studies. And then we'll also should also have a guest lecture on how humans can interact with AIs. So for instance, what can we actually record? Things like EEGs and eye gaze and all of that, because there are so many different modalities we could use for interacting with humans that I'd like to spend a little bit of time thinking about what all the, the possible options are. So for today, I'd like to briefly review um, take home points from Corey's talk last week. And the reason for this is I find it much easier to um, remember things if I at least once after the talk go back and try to remind myself what I thought was, was super interesting uh, and was worth remembering. And so I went through and did this yesterday. Hopefully you'll find this interesting and useful, but also please do jump in when you, when you notice things that I've, for, I've forgotten or things that you think are particularly relevant. And then we'll talk about the two papers that were assigned for reading today. And then if there's time, we'll uh, also talk a little bit about possible ways of grouping people in projects. And by this, I just mean trying to help you find other people that could either work on a project with you or that could work on a project that's kind of adjacent to yours so that you have so that there are groups of people you can bounce ideas off of so that if you want to work on a project by yourself, there's also other people you can still brainstorm with because you're working on something somewhat related. One of the biggest claims that Corey made last week, the, the somewhat inflammatory claim, is that everything is human in the loop. And I think, I think I buy it. So you were talking, okay, well, the raw data is really collected by humans and is about humans, and it's going to be designed by humans. Processing the data is, is going to be uh, done by humans. So one of the things I've heard repeatedly is that when you do machine learning in school, you get some data and you use it. Once you go into the real world, processing the data is a huge thing that we often don't talk about in academia. So thinking about, I've got data that's missing. I've got missing uh, uh, features for different data sets. I have just so much noise. I need to think about what to exclude. I need to figure out how to, if I've got categorical, so I've got uh, some variables that are red, green, and blue, and other variables that are numbers, and other variables that are true and false, how do I put those together? How do I make sense of all of those? 
obviously the AI and ML is going to be divide, designed by humans, at least for now. And then ultimately, it's going to do something that's going to interact with humans, or at least it's going to influence the world that we inhabit. And while we're thinking about this whole, well, all machine learning involves humans in the loop, Corey was also talking about fairness, accountability, transparency, and safety. And that's one of, the, one of the hotter topics in AI right now is thinking about how do you account for bias? How do you try to combat that? And one of Corey's points was, well, if you don't think about this from the start, you're definitely going to miss it. Just because you try to anticipate what's going could go wrong doesn't mean you won't have anything go wrong. But if you don't try to think about what could go wrong, then it's very likely to happen and will catch you unawares. This is particularly important as AIs make more decisions for us. So as they help adjudicate loans, who gets a loan? That better be uh, fair. That better not be biased. And if your loan gets denied, hopefully there's a way that then the bank can say either here's why you were denied or ideally, here's what you could do to make it less likely for you to be not denied next time. So many, most of you probably know about credit scores. Credit scores are fairly opaque, but they determine a lot about how you get loans and the, the interest rates of those loans. And if the credit companies can come to you and say, not only here's how we calculated your credit score, but here's what you could do to raise that score in the future that kind of interaction is much more appealing to humans in general, instead of just a machine telling you, here's your number, thank, thank you for your time, you don't get a loan. So Corey talked about this kind of three phase um, system where there is the design, develop, analyze, evaluate, iterate, and then deploy and disseminate. So for this class, I think what's most important, what we're, what we're going to be spending, you know, the first month or so of the class is really in this design phase, figuring out what we want to do. You've got this end of term project. What are you going to try to do? How are you going to, to measure it? And then, in, and then in phase two, we can think about what do we want to compare with? How are we going to analyze it? And then phase three is just gonna be the very end of the semester where I wouldn't really say we're gonna deploy a system, but we could certainly evaluate it. And then in the final report and the final presentation, you're going to have to communicate this to other people in the class and explain how you made some of these, some of these design decisions and what you found out. So I think this, this 10 step framework could absolutely be something that we use to guide how we do these pilot studies in the class. I'm not going to require it, but if you wanted to think about how can I take these 10 steps and apply it to my, to my um, idea, to my project, I would guess that would give you a very nice template to think about how you can make concrete progress on this project and would also make writing up your final, uh, your final report and also your final presentation a little bit easier. Because now we as a class have this shared template, this shared understanding for how to talk about interactive machine learning. And then Corey went through a couple of activity, activities. So there was the whiteboard where we we're saying, well, what, what can we do if we're just standing in front of a whiteboard? What can we think about? What are the, what's the hypothesis, the goal, the stakeholders? And if we did not have compute, what could we do? How could we take a first pass at this? And then if we have compute, what does this enable or what does this make harder? And the thing I really liked about that is a lot of the problems we think about solving, somebody else has made some progress or there is some existing ways of doing it. Maybe they're not great, but if we think through those, what's existing, then we can compare to them and then we can make sure that we're doing better. Because as, as we uh, saw in one of the papers we read for today, if we're not adding value, then what the heck are we spending all this time and thought on? 
if we're not making things better and if we can't quantify how how that is better then it's hard to justify all this time we're spending on on machine learning and then we also did this uh five five minute exercise on the pre-mortem talking about what could go wrong how things could be avoided so thinking about what could possibly happen if this system does not function as i'd like it to what could happen what assumptions could be violated and then what would happen to the system how would that affect people how would that affect the system but really thinking about what's the worst thing that could happen but also what are the what are the common cases that we need to think about and look out for because if you don't think about them you're much more likely to run into them so that was a really brief overview of what we uh, talked about with Corey last week. Does anyone have any comments they'd like to add either in the Discord chat or um, using the microphone? I do see someone's typing, so I'm gonna hang out here for a second. And then the person stopped typing when I said that. So hopefully people, I, I found Corey's talk um, quite, well, amusing, uh, entertaining, but also, also really insightful. But I'm a bit biased because I've known Corey for years and like his style. Hopefully other people uh, found, also found that interesting. Uh, like I said before, throughout the semester, I'm going to try to uh, get additional guest speakers come in to not only switch things up, but also because they bring outside perspectives that they can represent themselves much better than, than I can necessarily represent them. All right, enough stalling. So the first paper I asked you to read was from about 20, 21 years ago, Principles of Mixed Initiative User Interfaces. So the thing I want to, to emphasize here was the mixed initiative bit. So thinking about if, if you go into Excel, it's really you doing everything. You are telling this program what to do and it is supporting you. And really we want to get more to the point where we have more of a collaboration where the software or hardware can help anticipate you and can help you to achieve some goal that is not just the person driving, but it could also be the software taking initiatives, the software helping to drive the process to getting towards some desired outcome. So for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time reading papers, I thought I would take a little bit of time to kind of, um, <laughs> um, uh, one person mentioned, did this paper go on to create the paperclip in Word? And we will get back to Clippy in a little bit. Um, so when, when I read a paper, well, for, first of all, if you've been paying attention to AI and machine learning, you'll notice that there are an incredible number of papers coming out. There is one website is called Archive Sanity. So archive is a common place to post preprints. Archive Sanity is a website that tries to help find papers you could be interested in. Similarly, Google Scholar has a recommendation system where it tries to scan published papers, a lot of them on archive, and find things that are relevant to you. And I find myself needing something like this because if I just do a keyword search for reinforcement learning, there are so many new papers every week, there's no way I can keep up. So let's say uh, maybe once, once a week, let's say I've got 10 papers that I might be interested in. I can't read those 10 papers, I just don't have time. So what I personally try to do is look at the authors in the abstract, so to try to get a sense of the paper. If, I, if the authors are someone I know that has done research that I liked, or if the abstract looks interesting, then I'll look at the whole paper. 
if I get the whole paper, I usually flip through and look at the pictures. Um, it, it, pictures aren't just for, for kids' books. For me, that, get, that helps me understand usually what's the setting, because I care about what the experimental setting is, but also get a sense of the, of the results. What are they going to show me? And then try to go to the conclusion. So hopefully the conclusion and also the introduction, so the introduction should tell you why you want to read this paper. Why is it worth me spending some amount of time reading this thing that, that the authors put uh, likely weeks or months of time into? What am I going to get out of it? And the conclusion usually briefly summarize, so summarizes here why the, here's why this paper was cool. So if I can read the abstract, so I, I usually read the abstract, maybe I skim the intro and read the conclusion. At that point, I decide whether it's worth reading the paper. And reading a reading a ten page paper, eh, maybe maybe takes twenty or thirty minutes. But that's just the first pass. If I really want to understand a paper, probably twenty minutes is not going to be enough. If I want to really understand a ten page paper, I'm going to do that twenty or thirty minute pass. Probably walk away and then come back and plan on spending an hour to hour or two with it. But the papers that I spend an hour or two with are, again, relatively few because I just don't have enough time to read everything that's coming out, even if it's pr really interesting. So if, if you have another system for reading papers, that's totally cool. I just thought I would, I would present what I try to use to, to keep track of an overwhelming number of papers to try to figure out how I want to invest my time. Now, one thing I have not done in a number of years is after that two or three hour pass, if you really want to use this paper, if you want to implement it, then you want to go all the way to the code level. Did the authors open source some of their code? If so, you should dive into it. Did the authors do some proofs? If so, you probably want to go through line by line and make sure you can fully understand each step of the proof. Or if they say, um, you know, if it's just a proof sketch, going and trying to fully understand that proof can be really useful. Similarly, in my 20 minute pass, sometimes in the two hour pass, I kind of skim over equations. That's because I personally do a lot better with English text rather than equations. But if I'm gonna really fully understand a paper, if I'm gonna re-implement that, if I'm gonna use this technique, I better be able to fully explain that equation to somebody else who hasn't read this paper. So when I, when I assign, assign reading, I am not necessarily expecting you to take that two or three hour pass on each of the papers. If you found the paper particularly useful and wanted to use it for your project, then it might be worth your time. But thinking more about the, you know, how, how can I take this high level pass of a paper and try to understand what, why I might want to read it, what, what the point of the paper is, and also form some opinions on it. So I was trying to think in, in, in prepping for this, for this lecture, trying to think about what is important about a paper. So trying to figure out what are the take home points? What, what did the authors try to make you remember? And then personally, what did you like or dislike? Um, newer students will typically read a paper and then just kind of absorb it at face value. But it's important, it's an important skill to learn uh, that papers are not perfect. So you need to be able to pick apart what could have been better. But also recognizing that actually some parts of some papers are really awesome and uh, may maybe not at a cocktail party, but maybe at a uh, gathering of nerds, uh, it's something you might want to point out because other people would find it particularly cool. Or, or something was particularly interesting. And another thing is a lot of papers say, you know, here's, here's what we did, but here's what we'll do as future work. And future work is often, here's what I'm going to say could be done so that the reviewers don't get upset at me for not doing it. And I actually have no intention of ever doing it myself. But future work is a great place to get ideas. So if you're, think, if you're reading a paper and you see some, some future work that is interesting, write it down. Because at some point, 
you are going to have some extra time and having a list of projects that you found interesting means you could easily go to one of those. And even more likely, there's going to be a, a smart undergrad who's in their, their final year and they come to your lab and say, you know, I, I'm really interested in what you're doing. What, is there anything I could do to, to help you out? What, what do you think would be, would be fun for me to do? And if you have this list of future work, then you can very easily talk with this student and say, hey, here's a project I never had time for, but here are the steps we could do together. And you know, after, after a couple of months, three months, maybe this could turn into a paper. Or maybe after, after a couple or three months, we can do this preliminary work to decide whether it's worth going and investigating and turning this into a paper. So it's a very nice way to build collaborations and help, help younger students if you have this kind of list of projects that you, you found interesting, that are potential projects that either you've come up with or you've seen in the literature. Are, when people are reading papers, are there other things in particular that they look for when they're, when they're thinking about it? I want to, if I want to critically read a paper, what other things should I consider? Off the top of your head, do, do people have other things they think of? Oh, yes, limitations. So, uh, I, pet peeve is when someone says, look, my method works better than this other existing method, but doesn't say where or why or where it will fail. Oh, yes, the related work section. You can, uh, scholarship is really important and showing how your paper relates to this large existing body of work not only helps situate the paper, figure out what you're talking about, how it's different than other papers, but also is so useful for people who are just getting into a field. So if you're new to a field, I highly recommend something like survey articles, but even if you're just trying to read this one paper, understand it, excuse me, understanding what it's building upon and how it's different is so useful. Oh, yes. So wondering about whether they actually covered the goals they laid out in the introduction. When I review a paper and the introduction says, we invent this method to solve, to, to extend reinforcement learning to real world tasks. And then all their experiments are done on grid world or mountain car then if the introduction talks about real world tasks, the paper better follow through. Similarly, if the introduction says, we show our methods significantly outperforms other methods and they don't run any statistical significant tests, that's a little annoying. If the paper says, we prove that our method works better and then they just have a bunch of examples where their method empirically works better than something else, that's another pet peeve. Oh, interesting. One, one comment is uh, alignment between the pilot study versus what they claim. Yeah. So when they say, well, our experiments show that um, X helps a lot. And actually, well, the, the pilot study just kind of suggests it might help. And it's, it's really hard. If you say, my method lets the agent get more reward in Mario, that's very different than saying, my method outperforms state of the art and trying to figure out what, what kind of claims you should really make based on what you find out. Do the charts and figures actually help? If um, charts and figures take up a lot of space relative to tables and text, but they're often critical for explaining what you really want. If they are not helping with your explanation, you probably just wasted some space. You should probably go back and spend some more time on those to make them pretty. <laughs> uh, nice, looking at the y-axis scale for the plots. So one, one thing I love is, um, so I think this was true a lot in vision, I wanna say natural language processing, but they would go from 99% accuracy to 99.2% accuracy and talk about this incredible improvement. And yes, if you look at the relative improvement, that's interesting. But in the greater scheme of things, 
can you do something with 90.2% that you couldn't do with 90%? That's always difficult. Oh yeah, thinking about pre assumptions from previous work. So it's very common to make an assumption and say, oh, well, and it's the same made as Taylor et al. in 2017. And then you go back and look at Taylor et al. 2017, and they make this wild assumption that actually doesn't make any sense, but they were just making it because without this assumption, they really couldn't make any initial progress. Maybe you need to take a step back and say, well, can we make more realistic assumptions? Can we do without those assumptions? Oh, and, and there's the comment about reproducibility. That, that's another huge problem. So Joelle Pinot has been doing some, some great um, work on promoting reproducibility. So there's, it's a problem in all of science, but in computer science, it should be relatively easy, right? We, uh, we should be able to share our data, share our code, and we don't always do that. So not, not only is it hard for other people to reproduce your results to see if they're actually correct, see if you made a mistake, see if you claimed something that was too broad, but also when someone wants to build on your work, you know, Matt, you did, you did this great thing. I re would really like to take that and add on to it. Oh, and of course I'll cite your work. Oh, sorry, that was a MATLAB script and we lost it. No, no, put it on GitHub, make it available, back it up, add some documentation. Okay, so there are a bunch of things that you can think about when you're reading a paper, trying to decide what should I get out of it? How should I engage with this? So I wanted to go through the first paper, Eric Horvitz's paper, and kind of hit these, hit these different points, what I thought was interesting. And then after that, I'm gonna ask you to go into breakout rooms where you try to come up with these or these other points for the second paper. So in the first paper, there, there was, they were talking about, we need some principles. We want to help people to make better um, design decisions in their AI enabled um, programs. But we also wanna figure out how to evaluate these programs. What, what makes one program better than another? So Dr. Horowitz outlined 12 different principles. I kind of mangled some together in here, uh, but at a high level, I really liked this, thinking about what is the value. If I'm going to invest in this AI system, it's, it's going to be much more complicated than a normal, a normal piece of software. It's much harder to debug. It better be adding significant value. I better be thinking about uncertainty and attention. If the person, especially now, so if you, probably this is true of you as well, if you look at my Chrome browser, it has an absurd number of tabs. And that's only one window. I've got multiple Chrome windows with multiple, yeah, so the chances of me paying attention to any particular open Chrome tab is actually pretty small. And then we've got multiple windows because now we have big monitors and, and what is the user even paying attention to? And then thinking about, the cost benefits and uncertainty. So again, if, if I take an action, what's the possible benefit to the user? What's the possible detraction for the user? How might it hurt? And think about how to make this a dialogue. It's not a one-time decision. It's not you interact with the program, the AI either takes a decision or doesn't and then goes away. Instead, it's this ongoing conversation where the program in general, in, in, at least in this setting, the program is trying to help you accomplish your goals. So being able to quickly start the AI or tell the AI stop, you're doing the wrong thing, collaborate in an appropriate way, remember what the person was talking about. So if the person was just doing something having to do with setting an appointment next week, and now the AI suddenly brings up an appointment that's happening a month away from now, there may be some disconnect. And one of the most interesting things to me was thinking about the continual learning. <coughs> so how the program can learn over time to perform better, either across all, all users or try to personalize for this one user. So, has anyone actually seen Clippy? 
If if you have ever seen Clippy in action, put a seven in the chat. I remember, oh, this is awesome. I don't feel so old now. Um, I was so excited the first time Clippy popped up and wanted to help me. You know, it just just a little AI that could. And then then it turns out the AI is the AI that couldn't. He's a, a great, I say he, it. It's a great example of a well-intentioned product which people found incredibly annoying because it would pop up at the wrong time and not offer value. Um, you, there, there's a bunch of Clippy memes. Uh, here, here is one of the less offensive ones that I still found amusing. Uh, so another thing that was in this paper that I liked is there was this case study. There was this ongoing grounding. So the, the paper has a bunch of, a bunch of abstract points. So the, these 12 guidelines are important, but it's really dry. So just like in, in Corey's paper that we read for last week, he had a bunch of principles. And I think those, those principles and ideas were really important, but it, it's hard for me to pay attention to those in the abstract. So being able to ground those principles and how to think about them in a particular case study helps you not only digest them, but <laughs> um, also not only helps digest them, but, but uh, helps you apply them and understand how they might be useful. And another thing that I found useful was thinking about the value of information or the cost of actions. So this, this was probably my favorite figure from the paper. Thinking about, I've got some, some kind of probability that the user wants to do something. And I could either take an action or not take an action. So I could either act or I could not act. And if I act and I do the right thing, I get some, I do well. If I do not act and I do the right thing because the user did not want me to act, I do the right thing. But then I might do the wrong thing. And I'm used to thinking about should I act or not? And this paper does a really nice job of saying why it's not act or not, it's act or not given these two different settings. So there's actually four individual cases, not just should I act or not. So that was, in, in retrospect, it seems kind of obvious, but I really liked, I liked this diagram and I liked the way he changed the diagram over time, showing how this was a useful way of, of thinking about probabilities and utilities. So those, those I thought were the main take home points. Other things that I, I liked and disliked, I really liked the uh, talking about user attention. I think that would be really interesting for, for follow up. So for instance, if you have, so um, gaze tracking, you have, you have some either a head mounted or a, a thing in front of you that's trying to track where your gaze goes. So for instance, if the computer knows your gaze is on the other monitor, then the application that's on the monitor you're not looking at probably should not do something crazy. Similarly, if you're tabbed off that window or you haven't interacted with that window for a while, that's probably something you should take into account. One of the things I'm personally interested in is related to attention, something called cognitive load. So for instance, if you are doing a difficult task if you, a good, a good example could be coding. If you are coding something complex, you're often thinking about a number of different things. You're thinking about different functions you have, what are the variables you're changing, what's the high level idea, what is the algorithm or equation you're currently thinking about. And then if all of a sudden a ping comes in saying, hey, do you wanna get uh, dinner tonight? That's incredibly distracting and trying to figure out how to allow someone to focus, but figure out, oh, actually, if that's my wife talking about, I need to pick up my kid from school, that is something that should go through. And trying to figure out not just what is the user paying attention to, but could they multitask right now? And if they multitask, how is that going to affect their main, their main application? 
So another, another example, if I'm just coding, maybe that doesn't matter. If I am um, trying to do something more important, so like teaching this class, maybe it's even worse if I get interrupted while teaching a class because then it's wasting all of your time. So trying to figure out how, what is the person doing? Could they handle another task? And what's the, what's the trade-off? What's the possible negative consequence if I interact? Also, I thought this paper was quite well written. Um, it is very easy to focus on the science of the paper and not worry about the presentation. But in this case, I think both were good. I thought that I personally found the lifelong learning and customization very interesting. So there was that one curve where you looked at or where he showed how different lengths of email messages might correspond to different optimal times to pop up a, a scheduling notification and trying to figure out, could I better customize that? So figure out, oh, if I get an email from my chair, I'm much more likely to read that whole thing before scheduling a meeting. Whereas if I get an email from a student, maybe I want to respond more quickly. And thinking about how do I learn these probabilities? How do I learn these utilities? How do I figure out how much a dialogue or an update with this person would help and change things? I think that that could be, could be fine tuned across the population, also for individuals. Um, let's see, and the final two points I had were thinking about, great, we've got these, we've got these points, how could I use them? So thinking about if I want to do a human subject study, which of these points could I use or argue that I don't, I don't care about because I just want a person to help Mario learn, learn to play the game faster. Another thing that um, could be extended for future work is, okay, we've got these abstract principles. How do we actually apply them? And that's where this second paper comes in, talking about human subject studies. So then going beyond, here's some general principles, now going and actually getting uh, HCI experts to think about these principles, look at them and say whether, whether they're there or not. You could also think of having non-experts try to evaluate these AI-enabled programs and see if the things they think are good or bad correlate with any of these principles. Because if so, then these are absolutely things we as programmers should be thinking about leveraging when we are coming up with new programs or mod uh, interaction modalities. All right. So what I, what I tried to do there was kind of outline what I thought was interesting about that, that paper and model kind of how I went through it, thinking about what I thought the main points were and what was interesting. And now what I'm gonna ask is that we go into breakout rooms and try to do something similar with the guidelines for human AI interaction. So what we, man, let's, could someone please take a screenshot of this and put it into the Slack window for everyone? So what I'd, what I'd like to do is put people into breakout rooms and I would ask that the group elect one person as a scribe that person's gonna be responsible for taking notes and will um, dump a bunch of notes into the Discord at the end of the breakout room. Thank you, but thank you both. And the main thing, I'd, I'm, I'd like to go for a little bit longer this time. So I'd like to give the groups 10 minutes. The main thing I'd like you to do is summarize the take home points for the paper. If there is time in that 10 minutes, you are more than welcome to go on to the next three points. What did you like or dislike? What was particularly interesting? What follow-up work was there? And in each of these groups, you are welcome to either, uh, someone could say, well, why don't I be the leader? And that person could be in charge of uh, leading the discussion and getting to some kind of conclusion within those 10 minutes, or you could just go by consent. Uh, I guess I can uh, be the representative for group two. Um, yeah, we just, we based, I guess the first conclusion that we came to was just, oh, it was like the biggest takeaway we had was these 18 design guidelines. Like they were really well thought um, and how they might help um, just in HCI in general and all, obviously with our projects. Um, and then I guess we went into like more specific things with um, 
uh, within the paper, um, we talked uh, we talked quite a fair bit about how they were super systematic about um, coming up with the guidelines, testing the guidelines, and actually and also refining the guidelines down to um, the eighteen. Um, we thought the phase four iter the four phase iterative process uh, was well thought and explained. Um, dividing the categories was also nice because it gave a good way of quantifying things even further into just uh, categories to think about when you're you know uh, designing like a human agent system. Um, and uh, emphasis on trade-off between generality and specialization. I forget which one that what that was exactly. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm forgetting the, the last few points, but that was, we talked a lot about how like they did really well in terms of um, the experiment design and it was very well thought out and how um, basically at the, right before phase one, there's a nice little thing um, that talks about the two biggest takeaways from the paper, which were, uh, sorry, let me try and find it again. Um, uh, in this work, we synthes one, synthesize a unified set of design guidelines for a variety of communities and sources, and two, systematically examine those guidelines in a variety of AI and few systems to validate their applicability and relevance. So they're very clear as to what they're doing, and we think that they did both very well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. That that's one of the things I like when, when a paper says, here are the contributions of the paper, and at the end says, here's how we made these contributions. Makes it easy to review and makes it easier to understand what you're supposed to get out of it. So then uh, the next group, would someone be willing to talk through any of these that are different? The one that starts with main takeaways? I can talk. Um, so our first point is pretty much everything David said there about the process of generating and refining the guidelines. Um, the second point though, we noticed that still at the very end when they bring their guidelines to the experts and have them rate them whether they're easy to distinguish or the meanings are the same, um, there's still some disagreement amongst experts uh, even after this whole process. So, you know, guidelines can never be entirely perfect even after this big uh, way of generating them. Um, the next point was that figure two kind of shows how clear the different guidelines were. And we noticed that there, in all the categories, there's people who think that they're very confusing or somewhat confusing. So again, that shows that people are gonna interpret guidelines, you know, different ways, even if you try to put all this effort to make them as unambiguous as possible. Um, and we also noticed on that figure that all the guidelines relating to social norms, like um, the one uh, to take social norms into account and also reduce biases were the most confusing ones for people. Um, so we were wondering if that's related to, you know, social norms being relative or changing. Nice. Yeah, and there's definitely discussion on what are social norms, how do they apply, and that so so much depends on who the audience is. So what's what's appropriate for um, a bunch of academics versus what's appropriate for a bunch of gamers? It could be could be vastly different. And then maybe maybe someone from the third group that begins with notes. Yeah, I can I can talk about this one. Um, yeah, so I, th oh, I guess we, we thought that the background, um, so like in general, they were kind of started with saying there's a bunch of guidelines across all these different background papers and there's no like clear consensus as to which are the most useful and it's like, it's tough, right, to find <laughs> which ones you want to use. So I thought it was really nice that they like did all this work for us. They went through all these background papers, found all these guiding principles and kind of tried to really narrow it down to these 18 points, which is fascinating that it could be narrowed down to, I guess, 18, um, assuming that they're actually good, which I'll maybe discuss a little more. But it, I think that's like a pretty great contribution that if this is actually used like in the future and going forward, that it's nice to have like a narrowed down set of guidelines instead of 
kind of this whole distribution across different papers and stuff like that. Um, and then like furthermore, when we look at the actual like plots, I guess, let's see what figure it was. It was figure one. Yeah, if we look at those and kind of the discussion afterwards, it's, it, was, it was interesting to see that there was no like guidelines that were just like terrible or like th there was none that were that people really were like, this does not apply at all. Like they were kind of all used to some extent. Um, and that was, uh, at least to me, it was really surprising that there was none that were just like, this is like really amb ambiguous and not useful. So that was kind of nice to see. And they were kind of distributed across all the different categories as well of like applications, like e-commerce, navigation. Like there was some guidelines, like each of the guidelines were used in each of these things to some extent, which was also um, good to see, I guess, that they're actually applicable. Um, and then I guess the, some other comments about the paper was like the diagrams were maybe a little bit challenging to read, like that figure one, there was kind of a lot going on, maybe not as greatly explained as it could have been. Uh, and then there was an, one more point that maybe is a little bit, um, not exactly like to the main point of the paper, because the paper is trying to like state that there's 18 guidelines that uh, we can use, but the point about which of these actual guidelines had the most um, like violations or people thought that a lot of the applications actually violated this guideline. And it was, I guess, interpretability was one of the big ones. And what was interesting was that people would say like, there was no interpretability at all. Like they didn't explain at all as to why um, this like happened in this application or why this was occurring. Or in some cases it would give you some interpretability, like suggest like, oh, this is the best route and you should follow this. Um, because of your previous behavior or something, but then the people would be, they would want more <laughs> information. So they would want, want more interpretability. And then the question is like, you can kind of go down this rabbit hole of how many whys can you ask about interpretability? And um, that becomes an interesting question as well. But I guess that's a little bit um, shying away from the main point of the paper, which is just to provide guidelines and not interpret which ones are being violated. And that's all the points. Thanks. Yeah, I, I personally am very interested in interpretability. Um, one hypothesis I, I don't think has been tested, but probably should be, is that having different levels of interpretability should generally be useful. So if, if you say, why should I take this route? And then the nav app says, because it's the fastest. That's going to be more than enough for most people. But if you are interested, getting that next level. This is going to be fastest because this other route has lots of congestion right now. Or this is going to be fastest because my predictive algorithm says the time on this route is 20 minutes, the time on this other route is 25, but the time on the route I suggested for you was 17. So being able to drill down both based on your interests but also your background. Because if you are a machine learning expert, you may want a very different level of explanation than my parents do. Or if I'm just in the car and I just want to get to McDonald's quickly because I am hungry and I want my chicken nuggets, then maybe I don't care so much about the underlying algorithmic details. Um, and then, okay, so now, now would also be a chance uh, for me to ask if, if anyone had any comments on things, other things that they particularly liked or disliked or found interesting, either, either via voice or in Discord. And I, I recognize I only gave you 10 minutes, so if you did not get to these, I won't be in, incredibly surprised. Um, there was one other thing that I also like kind of bothered me is that for these studies they for like the main one I guess the phase three part they used 49 people um, and I think they do cite something saying like from another paper that they say that you only need like two or three people to evaluate each category for it to be effective but it's I didn't read that paper um, of course but <laughs> it seemed a little controversial it's still like 49 people was enough in my opinion, in a sense. So I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's a large enough sample size to conclude things. And like, what, what is a large enough sample size as well? Because even like in the phase one or two part, I think they had like 11 of their own company employees, which is like heavily biased to the people that are selecting these guidelines in general that narrowed it down to 20 at the beginning. So 
I was also a little skeptical of that part. I, I thought it was weird that all the authors were affiliated with Microsoft and they talk about recruiting participants from a large software company. Oh, who could it be? Um, but, but that's a great point about, about the um, uh, statistical significance and the power of the study. And the, a, a lot of this, um, uh, the human uh, interaction literature does do some pretty uh, more heavy stats than a lot of the machine learning literature, because you need to think about is 49 people enough? If I got 100 people, would that expect? Would I expect that to change my results? Would I would I expect it to increase my certainty, or am I just going to be wasting my time? Any other comments before I go on? There was a bit of a common thread between uh, this one and and this the uh, the first paper. Well, I, other than like the entire topic, but in the first one they had that little inaction versus action graph. And they showed how if you added discussion into it, uh, you, you can take out some actions that you don't want to, to do. Like if Clippy comes up and says, do you want me to make a meeting? And you can say no, and that's helpful. Um, but it's also not as helpful if it keeps on asking you questions like the delete this item. Are you sure? Are you really sure? Uh, those things make it worse. So kind of the the more action that the person has to do, the less valuable of a surface service it is. And then uh, to the this paper where they're saying that, um, oh, this navigation app is great, but it's assuming a bunch of things. It's assuming healthy, it's assuming walking speed or um, the voice communication one with, uh, it starts off with a, a female voice. You can switch it, but it chooses to start off on, on this. And it's one of those things where most people find the application more useful if they don't have to fine tune a bunch of things. If they just use it and it works and later they can go through options and change something if they want. Uh, I, I just found that kind of an interesting topic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, clearly if you have a voice assistant, the right voice is Morgan Freeman, hands down. But if he is not available, you may want to customize which, which voice you want to use. And figuring out how much you want to, uh, one thing you could do is before you let a user uh, interact with some application, you sit them down and ask a series of 100 questions to figure out their preferences and biases, and then the app is customized to them. And then, they might have spent 30 minutes filling that out. They play with the app for three minutes and then delete it. So that was just a huge waste of time. On the other hand, you could just throw someone at the generic app and they customize it over time. But unfortunately, they don't like the default settings and it's so bad they use it for three minutes and delete it. So there's this entire spectrum where you, you may want to have things more or less customized or personalized and how to do that at the beginning can be really tough. So a few other, so I figured, so, so this is, uh, I, I get to teach this class, so I figured I get to put in my own opinions as well. Um, I liked the phrase AI infused products. I hadn't seen that before, I liked that. I, I think we are going to see more AI infused products over the, the coming years. I also like how they cited the previous paper as Horvitz's formative paper. Now, when, when I cite my own papers, of course, I mean, and of course, the amazing groundbreaking work by Taylor et al. Um, so I, I just thought that was a, a nice, nice little turn of phrase. Uh, we already mentioned that there's lots of venues for this kind of work. Um, another thing they talked about, so one of the initial things that we were thinking about was like, you want to be conservative at the beginning and maybe be carefully explore versus exploit. And those are exactly the kinds of things that machine learning people want to think about, but it's really not exposed to the user. So they're not really gonna be able to evaluate it. I liked that they were paying these HCI professionals up to $70 an hour. Uh, when, when you are using something like Mechanical Turk, I usually go more for the Canadian minimum wage. So thinking about $15 an hour Canadian, and then if they're working in a different country, that's even a better rate. But if you want professionals, you better be willing to pay. Uh, I, think, I think that's actually a Microsoft policy. 
Because uh, when I worked there, I remember the software engineers telling me that if they wanted to use Mechanical Turks, they had to pay like Microsoft level of wages. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. So I think that might be a Microsoft thing. I'm not sure though. Well, if you are one, one of the cash rich uh, companies in the world, that, that is completely reasonable policy. Uh, for if you run a study, if, if you would like to pay $70 an hour, you are more than welcome to out of your own pocket. Um, there was a nice section on the demographics. So there was a comment in Discord saying, oh, well, Apple and Microsoft employees might have different opinions. That is exactly true. But thinking about what are the ages of these people? What are the backgrounds? What is their gender? All of that goes into this. And if we are having people evaluate and interact with this application, and that group of people is not the same as the actual users, then there could be interesting, important mismatches. So for instance, talking about the average walking speed. So if you have someone who is not able to walk or typically does not walk at a normal speed, they would be more likely to pick up on the fact that the navigation app, app does not let you set that speed. Whereas someone who is able-bodied might not notice that. There was a nice section on exclusions. When you get this data, it will be messy. If you're using a mechanical Turk, you will get some people who just give you garbage data. So figuring out how to filter that out is important. If you're interested in stereotype and gender roles, a friend of mine, um, Cynthia Matusik, uh, Professor Matusik, and her collaborators wrote, wrote this paper, um, which was looking at image search. So seeing things like stereotype exaggeration. So there, uh, there is, a, a, empirically, there is a number in, the U, in, in Canada, a number of uh, female doctors and a number of male doctors. But if you search, you are more likely to get an over-representation of male doctors. And they found that people may actually prefer those stereotyped images. So if you are looking for an image of a doctor, you may be much more likely to pick a male doctor because, and, and use in your presentation because that lines up with your stereotype. So that's one example of how these systems can be biased and understanding that that bias is there and how we may or may not want to combat it, I think is really important, which goes back to fairness, bias, and ethics. Um, Bon okay, so one person is talking about the bonus for including screenshots. Um, yeah, so thinking, and this is something we'll talk about later, when we're interacting with, with people, you, you can give them a base rate, and then maybe you want to pay them extra to incentivize them to do more or to do higher quality work. And figuring out exactly what that means and how it might cause unintended consequences is pretty interesting. So one thing you might think of in, in this example, let's say they're gonna pay 50 or $70 and you can earn up to this extra $20 if you do this extra work. One potential thing that could happen is if you asked for a lot of work for this extra $20, people might look at it and say, oh, 50 is more than enough. I'm not gonna do any of this existing stuff because 50 will buy me a nice meal. And so you need to think about how, how these incentives will, whether they will align with what you want to get and whether these screenshots are really worth it. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure I understand the application. Oh, I think, yeah, they, I think they were, with the screenshots, they were trying to say, could you show us examples of of, for a particular um, guideline, show how or where it was violated. So just coming up with those really concrete examples so that they, they would have these examples that it, instead of just having the text. This was one of my favorite pictures uh, because it was showing a number of these guidelines that had clear applications and clear violations. So being able to show that, yes, these guidelines are relevant. And I agree, some of these uh, diagrams were a little bit tricky to parse at the first time, but I thought this one was relatively well made and really hammered home that these 18 things we chose are actually relevant. All right, 
Uh, well, we've got three minutes left to talk about groups. One thing I could at least start, well, I didn't save the last slide apparently. Um, one thing you could start thinking of is how we should start thinking about grouping students so that you could find other people to talk to based on your project. So it could be the type of ML, whether it's reinforcement learning or supervised learning or unsupervised learning. It could be the domain area. So maybe the people who are interested in medicine would want to hang out. It could be the modality. So if you're talking about NLP versus um, uh, classification, uh, versus a human giving uh, rewards to an agent. That's not how you spell human. Uh, human rewards. So if, if you have ideas, be, because we've got mm, 35, 40 people registered for this class, I know that you will have overlapping interests and I'd like to facilitate those, those discussions. Part of this will, will be helped when we do introductions. But if you think of other ways we could kind of form these informal groups, either having channels in Discord or just introducing you to each other, so that as you have more ideas, you can bounce them off of each other. As you find interesting papers, you can share them with each other. I'd like to try to create these kind of clusters around something so that in, in addition to this very large class, to me, 35 is large. In addition to this large class, you can also have these smaller, more, uh, more relevant groups to the kind of, of uh, project that you are going to be.